Welcome back to The Exchange. Meta partnering with Blue Owl Capital on a $27 billion joint venture agreement to fund and develop the company's massive data center in Louisiana. This move comes just weeks after Meta announced a deal with CoreWeave for up to $14.2 billion worth computing capacity. Now, CoreWeave notably rents NVIDIA chips to power that cloud infrastructure. This is just one example of the Tangled's deal-making web happening across AI with chip makers, cloud providers, startups all intertwined, and let's not forget the financiers as well. Should investors be concerned that the circular spending might be the first sign of a bubble in space? Well, joining me now is Bradley Tusk, founder and CEO of Tusk Venture Partners. Great to have you on. And let's start right there and, and have you weigh in on this notion of whether this is getting bubbly or not. Yeah, I mean, I think, look, I assume that when these companies say we need to invest $10 billion, $100 billion, $500 billion into infrastructure for AI compute and the energy for it, that they're not just throwing away the money for no reason. They truly believe that for the various plans they have to come to fruition, that amount of compute is necessary, that amount of data centers are necessary. So if we assume that's true, the challenge that we run into is it's still quite risky, right? Because you have effectively about a dozen companies that are driving the market today, um, spending incredible amounts of money, taking out incredible amounts of debt. And it is risky because if their perceptions of what's needed turn out to be wrong, or if the timeline is different or anything else, you know, to have only a handful of companies effectively holding all of the upside and all the downside is a lot. And I think there's a, a revenue source that isn't being talked about, but should be. So when President Trump did his trade agreements with a bunch of different companies, some of them had components that included foreign investment in U.S. technology and the U.S. tech ecosystem. Mm. That includes UAE, so it's 1.4 trillion, Japan, 550 billion. Why don't we start including them in these deals and start spreading out the risk so it's not all on American companies, all not ultimately on the American economy and American consumers? And there's precedent. There are countries that have been good partners over time. So like, take the UAE, they've done a lot with us on nuclear, a lot on defense tech, so we know we can work with them. And this may be a little bit of a crazy idea, but I would love to get to a point where we're not only accessing these countries for capital, they said that they want to put into the U.S. tech system, um, but we almost create like an axis of good on AI. Who are the countries that are really valuing innovation and investment and sensible regulations, which means not you know a centrally controlled system like China, but not also as hands down as the EU, um, and use that to create a world of AI that solves massive global problems, whether it's mm. decarbonization or drug formation. I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here. And I think because everything is so frenzied, we're not necessarily looking at it. I think it's such a key point that you're raising, especially as we do have Korean officials, uh, according to reports in Washington this week, to try and hash out a trade deal with Korea that right. includes potentially investment into this country as well. Right. I it, get, it gets at, I guess, a broader topic, and that is the role that policy plays in all of this, especially if you start to look at uh, this AI buildup globally through a geopolitical lens. Yeah, sure. Um, look, there are countries that clearly want to do these deals with the United States. They seem to be the same kind of countries that are generally very interested in building their own AI infrastructure because you need it for your economy and you need it for national security, and that's only going to grow and grow. Um, and so, to me, let's not just make these all a bunch of random one-offs in, in different trade deals. Let's put it all together, put the capital in front of the U.S. companies taking on all this debt and all of this risk, um, aim it with a bunch of different policy things around AI regulation, around, you know, what can we use to really solve really big problems. And then the third thing I think that I didn't mention before is we also need to keep seeding a lot of money into the early stage of the U.S. tech world because, yes, it's great that we have these dozen or so companies that can do really well already if they have what they need, mm. but every company eventually gets stagnant one way or another. And if we have 10,000 or tens of thousands of earlier stage tech startups using AI to try to achieve different types of, you know, different types of goals, create different types of companies, services, products, everything else, among those are going to be the next NVIDIA's, Google's, Amazon's, whoever else. And so, yes, it's great to build all this infrastructure and capacity, but you need users for it. That's how you prevent a bubble from bursting. Yeah. Um, and I think in many ways, I would take some of that money from Japan or Korea or the UAE or wherever and say, here's a dedicated fund to really invest in all kinds of interesting 
early stage U.S. tech companies that can help ensure that there is demand in the future after all the stuff is built. Alphabet today unveiled a new quantum chip, Willow. Um, how is quantum computing going to fit into all of this as well? And I ask that knowing that I'm finding myself have increasingly having conversations about the fact that the promise of quantum computing is going to come faster than everybody anticipated. Yeah, that's definitely possible, and there's there's good and bad to that, but overall, more good. I mean, generally speaking, the more that we can solve really complicated technical problems and put them to actual use in the economy and in the world, that's a good thing to have. Um, it might increase, uh, ultimately, some of the infrastructure costs even more, because obviously operating quantum computing is incredibly intensive, especially on energy. At the same time, there is also a world where, between quantum, quantum computing and AI, you figure out ways to do AI that might not require as much compute and might not require as much mm. energy. So perhaps, you know, in a way, by bringing them into existence, we then develop the tools to actually solve the problem. All right. Bradley Tusk, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for having me.